Hi, welcome to 5 Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Adam Kucharski. Adam is an assistant professor in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His research uses mathematical and statistical models to understand disease outbreaks. And in 2014, he was recruited to analyze the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Adam earned his PhD in applied mathematics at the University of Cambridge. Today we're going to be discussing his book, The Perfect Bet, How Science and Math Are Taking the Luck Out of Gambling. I'm a sucker for anything math and gambling related. Let's ask Adam five good questions. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Adam Kucharski, author of The Perfect Bet. Hey, Adam, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. All right, thank you. So let's just jump right in. Um, question number one. What is it about gambling that seems to attract world-class mathematicians throughout history? Really, I think gambling is just this great way to explore ideas that involve luck and randomness and chance. And it's almost this playground for ideas because you have these games which are very well-defined. You have specific rules and it creates this situation where you can actually test out um, different theories about these kind of random events. And really, that's what people have done throughout history. Um, if you look at a lot of the early days of probability theory, this kind of idea of actually how likely is getting two sixes on a dice or this sort of thing. Um, people use these kind of games as a way of outlining things like the sample space. So the this is the space of all possible outcomes, and you can hone in on things you're interested in. It's a way of measuring the chance of a particular event. And as this moved on, um, other questions started appearing, things like statistics of if you've got a hypothesis, what kind of evidence do you need to test that? And again, things like casinos are this perfect laboratory full of all this random data. So a lot of the early pioneers of uh, kind of statistics and these theories. Um, and it's really just continued that we've seen um, from things like chaos theory, where you have these very small changes early on having big effects later. So it's commonly known as things like the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. um, that's very similar to something like roulette, for example, where you have this very small change in initial speed of the ball can ultimately end up with something landing very differently. So across history, it's not so much been mathematicians just trying to get rich, although some of them have definitely been trying to do that. Uh, it's also just them using these games to kind of play around with these ideas. It's this intellectual curiosity about how does the world work. And I think all of us, if we see something where somebody says to us, this can't be beaten. There's that kind of curiosity to find the loophole and find the way of um, getting an edge. That was one of the interesting things from your book that uh, I, I had, you know, I'd read about some of the other previous uh, things that were in there, but actually the the physics side of things, like with the roulette ball, um, I'd never read about <clears throat> actually almost trying to create a, almost like a godlike level of control, <laughs> and, you know, at the atomic level of a ball coming in and, and being able to figure out where is it going to end up? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a remarkable story about um, a few people have actually attempted it to try and use computers to track this trajectory. So if you can get enough information on what the ball's doing initially, can that give you not a perfect prediction, but enough to get an edge over the casino? Um, and it almost seems like the amount of things involved that this should be just too difficult to do. But actually, a few people have managed to to get this edge but in many cases it's just so sensitive to what's going on if the weather changes or if you've got somebody leaning on the table it just completely throws your predictions but i just think it's a great example of actually a pretty simple bit of physics one of the people i was chatting to was saying that they, they'd struggled to publish it not because it's too complicated or too secret but actually most academic journals won't take this research because it's so simple um so actually it took a long time for people to publish the equations and actually show the method properly could work um, because it was actually you know, relatively simple insight from university that was making them all this money. So question number two, uh, what mathematical techniques have been best applied successfully to gambling? Um, that's a great question. Really, I think many of the methods that have been successful is a situation where you can get more information than your opponent, you know, whether that's a casino, whether that's um, – you know, a bookmaker or I guess even in business and finance, it's, it's this kind of situation that crops up. Um, but the approaches have changed quite a lot. Uh, early on, um, if you go back a century or two, a lot of these methods are things you could do with pen and paper. If you had um, information on you know, a dice game, you could probably work out if it was biased or if it was in your favor. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing computers and these kind of things um, coming in. So one example is things like sports statistics, where just the sheer amount of you have hundreds and hundreds of matches to crunch through that information, you really kind of need to be adopting um, computational approaches. And that makes it 
in a way a bit more difficult because it's not necessarily that you can see an obvious insight. Um, one of the interesting things I found talking to teams who work on like horse racing predictions is that actually they have very li little interest in understanding why a particular horse will win. They just want this computational method that will give them a good winning prediction. They, they don't want to be experts necessarily. What they want is just a decent method. So I thought that was quite interesting that actually you can make quite a lot of money but actually have little, fairly little understanding of actually what's going on with it. I've, uh, I've read in previous, especially in the investing realm, about how a lot of times the, the very simple quantitative model actually doesn't represent the floor to which humans can add insight. It's actually probably the ceiling to which then humans often subtract uh, you know, their own biases from. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Just with these models in general, that often, um, I mean, one of the things that, that a lot of these gamblers have said that is not so much um, the traditional gambling community that's coming up with it. It's people kind of from outside who are happy just to trounce all over that dogma. That I think when you come, like whether it's investing or gambling, you have these very strong rumors and conventional wisdoms, and you kind of need people who are just, I guess, just got the, the the audacity to come in and say that you're doing it wrong and there's a better way of doing it. Yeah. So uh, question number three, what was the genesis of Monte Carlo simulations? And then also uh, maybe explain what it is for the for some of the sure. uh, viewers who don't know, quite understand it. And maybe myself, too. Hopefully I'll learn something. Um, <laughs> and also, what are its shortcomings? Yeah, so this is a technique that emerged um, is in the late 1940s. Was a mathematician called Stanislav Ulan who was working at um, Los Alamos um, on the, nuclear, the U.S. nuclear program. And one of the... the uh, the questions that they kept coming up with was understanding these neutron collisions, so these random interactions um, inside uh, this this kind of reaction process. And um, Ulam wasn't really like a traditional mathematician. He didn't really enjoy crunching through all these equations. Um, I think in some instances, you know, if he had to solve something lengthy in the blackboard, he'd do it and then just go home for the day. And he just really didn't like uh, taking that kind of very lengthy calculation approach. And he was. Um, at one time in hospital recovering um, from, a, from a brain infection actually and uh, playing solitaire and obviously if you, sometimes you lay out the cards you can have a situation you can win sometimes you're not and he was thinking a bit about the probabilities and then just the mathematics got too convoluted and, and just wasn't something he was prepared to crunch through so instead he thought well why don't I just lay them out a few times why don't I just simulate a few games essentially and see how often I get something favorable and something I don't and this approach actually became very powerful for the nuclear questions they were asking because they didn't have to get a pen and paper and actually solve the equations. They could just use a computer to simulate the random process and use that computational approach to gain some insight into the, um, into the randomness. And because they were working at uh, Los Alamos, they needed a code name for it. So they, um, because Ulam had an uncle who was quite a heavy gambler, they called it the Monte Carlo method. And and actually, this approach has become fundamental to, to kind of computational science. We use it in computer graphics. You use it in, if you use mathematical biology, you'll simulate all these, these complex biological processes because it's a really powerful way if you can't easily write with pen and paper what's going on, just actually use simulation to get around it. But that does have some drawbacks. As I mentioned earlier, this issue with um, understanding what's happening. Um, in some cases in gambling, you might not care too much if, you don't understand, but in areas of science and, and other areas of research, it can be quite dangerous to have this black box that you kind of shove everything in and simulate it. And you might say that's that's reality, that's the outcome, but actually you might not gain much understanding to the process. So your theory might not advance if you're using it for a biological process. You might not actually understand much about what's going on. Um, and there's also the danger that, of course, in physics, we have some understanding of what these fundamental laws are. So what particles should, in theory, do in other areas you don't. So the assumptions you put into these models, if you put in some bias or some problem, you're not actually going to be able to, to pick apart what effect that's having on your simulations. How about maybe even uh, speak to the if you're in a, dealing with a more like a power law, nonlinearity, um, you know, how does yeah. that break down your Monte Carlo? Um, so that's that's another really good point that often if you have these complex interactions where we have multiple, um, you know, whether it's an ecosystem with multiple populations or whether it's finance with multiple actors, um, that can create you know, a lot of, uh, of complicated dynamics. It, it again goes back to this idea with the roulette ball of a small change having a big effect. Um, and as soon as you're doing that, you might, for instance, 
do a few simulations and think that's what the system does. You know, that's how it behaves. These assumptions lead to these conclusions, but a very small change or something different in the structure could lead you to a very different conclusion. So it kind of requires a lot more care because it's this almost this black box you can't see inside um, to actually think about what the outputs are and how you interpret them. Right. So <clears throat> question number four, why is poker been is such a good challenge for artificial intelligence because that's really kind of where all the a lot of this mathematics is leading towards is is an artificial intelligence uh definitely and really games have been this this useful tool much like betting has been um but there's been a real change in how people tackle games um it was actually after the the famous kasparov deep blue match um in the 90s kasparov um was obviously a bit unhappy with the result but one of the reasons was um, the way in which he lost, that he was saying that in these these chess algorithms, they very much got something that played like a machine. It was something that could crunch through combinations and just essentially outcompete a human with sheer computational um, power. And yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah, you know, com computation. This was a phenomenal achievement. But Casper um, made the point that ultimately you didn't learn much about how humans make decisions because it was this game that you could adopt that kind of approach with. And, he actually said at the time that um, he hoped poker would be different because poker is this game where you don't have all the information in front of you. In chess, it's, it's a computational problem. It's how do you interpret the information you have? But in poker, it's much more about you can't see everything, so you've got to interpret your opponent's behavior. and You've got to develop almost some kind of uh, a set of assumptions, some model of what your opponent's going to do. Um, and in this respect, games like poker can be a much better test, um, potentially for artificial intelligence, because these algorithms have to deal um, with risk and uncertainty and actually these are, I think we're all familiar as humans when we deal with risk and decisions we can sometimes do some quite strange things so I think it presents not only from a computational point of view of trying to come up with these ideal strategies also just these questions of how should you even uh, you know, approach it what should your aim be in these games do you want to play defensively or how do you mimic humans I think Increasingly, these algorithms are actually challenging some of our notions about what makes our decision-making process humans and what's just something a computer can learn to do. So how far away are we from having a, an, a bot in the uh, World Series of Poker? I, I think it depends who you ask. Um, <laughs> I think there's, I mean, talking even since writing the book, actually, and you talked to these people a year or two ago, the, the field's just coming on so rapidly. And we saw earlier this year that Google um, and AlphaGo um, winning at Go. And this was a milestone I think a lot of people in the industry thought would stand for much longer. I think similarly in poker, um, things like No Limits, Texas Hold'em, these games that are played in the World Series, still have this reputation for being somewhat of an art, something that humans are going to be dominant at for a while longer. Um, I think it's just it's fascinating how quickly these algorithms are developing and, and what things are safe and what can ultimately be uh, defeated. Yeah, I mean, it'd, it'd be hard to imagine being able to beat uh, if if the bot was able to like record biometric, uh, you know, scans of you and see pick up your tells. And I mean, it wouldn't yeah, it would I mean, seem like it wouldn't be too long before they would <laughs> be able to beat pretty readily. Yeah, and it's, I mean, then you start thinking, you know, when you have that kind of understanding about and that learning process, other applications, good good and bad potentially, it's, you know, it's a really kind of amazing industry. And it's it's kind of fascinating that I think you have these games as, a, as an insight into it. Yeah, that's the really interesting thing is the games provide this sort of window and a, the, the playground and the sandbox, if you will, to, yeah. for all these experiments. So <clears throat> question number five, and this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good segue from what we were just talking about. So in free chess, and this may have changed, but my last time I had read a book about it, or my understanding was that that the uh, still the best, uh, like totally, you know, free chess. I guess you just should explain is is you can it's anything goes. Basically, you can have computers, humans, whatever you want, um, and that the still the best um, the the winners are the ones that are using a hybrid model of a human with the results of a computer kind of giving them different uh, scenarios and probabilities uh, that, but the AI like computer only hasn't quite gotten the best of the adding the human yet. Is that, uh, is that, is that true still? <laughs> Cause that uh, maybe in the last year or whatever, I mean, that could have been knocked out. Uh, but maybe the, the better question is what are the implications for other domains outside of like gambling and, and investing um, based on this, this uh, you know, starting off from a, a very 
uh, bounded world of chess, and then as it moves out towards, uh, you know, these other fields that have a lot more complexity to them. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting area. And it's, um, as far as I know, the, these computer human hybrids are still, still um, incredibly, incredibly competitive. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting as well in, in chess, obviously, as these computers became better, a lot of top players were just turning to use computers as these training um, tools. And we're seeing the same in poker, that these um, players are increasingly using these algorithms. And in many cases, they're adopting traits of the algorithms. One, one of the things that's uh, a potential trend that's developing, which um, is, is fairly recent, is traditionally um, humans are, are very susceptible to aggression. Um, because if you put someone under a lot of pressure to make a decision, they're more likely to make a mistake. Um, and uh, early on when these bots were being developed, the, the, the creators were being told by poker pros that their bots were too passive, that they, they actually, they, they, yeah, they weren't playing aggressively, they weren't so good. But in recent years, um, there's evidence that pros are actually becoming slightly less aggressive in their play in certain situations. So it seems that they're kind of adopting these lessons that have been learned by the bots where actually the best strategies aren't susceptible to aggression. And so I think in, in some respects, bots can, these, these hybrids can be very useful in you know, tempering potential bits of human psyche, which aren't necessarily the best way to go about decisions. But I think there's also um, a lot of situations in gambling and elsewhere where humans potentially still have the edge. One of the things that humans are incredibly good at are things like pattern recognition and making decisions with very little information. Um, increasingly, you know, whether you have computers competing in game shows or in situations where they've got to kind of intuitively grasp patterns, that's something which humans can still do remarkably well, um, especially if they have you know, almost like a, a very fraction of a second to make that decision. But it's still something that computers can't quite mimic in all these situations. So I think in, in that respect, I mean, you, you may have come across things like image identification. Sometimes algorithms will throw up really bizarre matches and something that a human would never do. So I still think having that independent human validation in, in these kind of situations can often drive things back to reality. But certainly, certainly in many cases, um, having those uh, artificial intelligence algorithms to guide humans and make them question their decisions uh, is going to be really important. I think in, in other industries as well, it can show us where our faults are, but then in turn, we can kind of use our own notions and intuition to actually um, to have almost a sanity check on what these algorithms are doing as well. Yeah, almost like I just thought of this, like that it's almost kind of the first time you had a, a control group against kind of human brain, um, you know, something that's sort of understood uh, how it was designed versus how we've always just had our, you know, our reptile brains. Uh, it's like the first time yeah. we've actually been had something to compare it to that wasn't didn't bring its own bias into it. Yeah. And I, I think it's also, it's just fascinating that often like in poker, for instance, a lot of these algorithms are, are coming up completely by They're literally just taught the rules, taught pay, you know, what's a, a profitable end game for them. Um, and then just just develop strategies. And they, they bluff and they deceive opponents. And they do things that we might think are very human things to do, but actually it's just mathematically optimal. So I think that's a really good way of putting it, that it is this control group where we can almost create these essentially ch child minds, billions and billions of them, and let them learn and let them develop their own way of doing things and see how closely that actually converges with our With our own generation to over yeah. the years to, or the eons to get where we are. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Huh, interesting. So bonus question we always ask, and this is for a book recommendation. What do you have for us today? Um, one book I really like actually is uh, Math on Trial. Um, so this, this came out a couple of years ago by, um, I think it's Leila Schneps and Colby Colmez. Um, and it looks at all of these, these different cases where mathematics and mathematical arguments have been used in the courtroom. Um, and there's some fairly well-known situations where you've got a miscarriage of justice because, um, for instance, somebody's treated two events as independent. You know, if you've had um, a, a, an illness or something where if you just look at the raw probabilities without accounting for kind of all the, the complexity and how these medical conditions work, you can potentially come to a, a very dramatically wrong conclusion. But one of the things that I particularly liked in the book is all the discussion of DNA evidence. That again, this situation where often if you have very small samples, you have to kind of make these conclusions of, is it the same person? Is it not? Um, and it's not and, as cut and dry, I think, as like the, the TV shows have it made out. No, to be. 
Um, and it's you end up with these kind of remarkably subtle statistical arguments. There are a few cases in there which I think most of us will have come across, but maybe not been aware of, of all the kind of the nuance of what was going on. And it was just fascinating to see how how close that actually this argument comes. And you know, evidence isn't something where it's yes or no. There's this kind of where do you draw the line? And yeah, I just thought it was a really fascinating book and, and insights into some quite familiar cases, but from a completely new direction. Huh, fascinating. Well, Adam, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, and uh, I love the topic of gambling and and uh, math and the intersection. So, I mean, this book was right right in my wheelhouse. Oh, glad to hear it, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to Five GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks, happy reading.